Phosphodot fans, Earl at thelogbook.com, back in the 80s, actually back in 1980, playing a semi-obscure game that is still kind of a cult classic, if for no other reason than for how many times and how many ways the basic game mechanic has been copied by other games. This is Crazy Balloon, released by Taito in 1980. Primarily in Japan, although I believe it did also make it over to the States. And if you don't recognize it already, you will probably be able to tell fairly shortly how familiar it is. Oh. You're trying not to do that. Lesson number one. Don't pop the balloon. Whatever you do, don't pop the balloon. Of course, that means you have to avoid colliding with all these asterisks. And this becomes a kind of a counterbalancing act with the dot that is holding the balloon in place. And you can't linger too long because that will happen. This jerk, this giant jerk face. It's like Bart Simpson from hell shows up and blows your balloon into an obstacle. So you can't stop and consider your... That was close. got to keep it moving. So we will endeavor to do that. Of course, now you have moving asterisks. And not just one of them, but two of them. Uh, boy, that's always... That sound effect is great because it just... just catches you off guard. It, it's such a jarring sound compared to the relatively gentle sound effects in the rest of the game. Gets me every time. Now this being in 1980, which was... Sort of the tail end of the 70s era of, I don't want to say lawlessness in game design, but it was definitely the Wild West. Anything went, and if you saw in someone else's game a game mechanic that you felt you could improve on, no copyright lawyer was going to stop you because there was no precedent for that yet in computer game software or in the design of arcade games. And so, really, the, the beginning of games being a copyrightable thing started with the arcade game Scramble, which was 1981, and it was kind of a drawn-out thing, but it established enough of a precedent that you very soon had things going on, like Atari getting the home console rights to Pac-Man, and, you know, first order of business, Al, was not getting a superior version of Pac-Man to market. The first order of business was suing everyone else who had done a near-beer version of Pac-Man or basically Pac-Man in every way but name. Go after all of these people and get their versions off the market. And, you know, then we'll give, you know, Todd Fry a very short window 
to turn out a workable version of Pac-Man on the 2600. This game also wound up with a lot of home ports as a result of emerging from that period of copyright law as it applied to video games not quite being settled. Oh, look at that. Even the Odyssey 2 had a version called Looney Balloon. Not Crazy Balloon, but Looney Balloon. Oh, well, now this just looks brutal. It really is, at, at the heart of it, it's a puzzle game. Let's attack? What are we attacking? It's a balloon, man. that sound effect. Let's attack. Let's not attack. Well, you talk about a game that deflates your ego. Official ports did come out, but much later. I remember there was one as part of a... PlayStation collection that was Phosphor Dot, uh, a uh, PlayStation retro collection that was only available as an import. Should probably play that sometime because that was uh, that was a favorite of mine. I in my PlayStation One days, I was very big on importing arcade compilations, and there was a nice title compilation that had this and a couple of other games on it. Crazy Balloon got copied a lot, but there is something truly <laughs> brutal about the original arcade game. It, it does not forgive much in the way of error, and, you know, it just, it depends on nerves of steel. So the attack, you know, has nothing to do with the balloon. Let's attack is, you know, let's attack your nerves. Let's attack your ability to not freak out, not panic, and complete the level. <laughs> 